Miracles. Miracles. For those who believe, no explanation is needed. For those who do not believe, no explanation is possible. Let's start with a few miracles, just looking at a few miracles. First, we have Easter Sunday morning when our Lord, on the first day of the week, comes out of a stone ground, out of the tomb. Now, the angel opened the tomb up after he had left. He had come through the wall of the tomb. And the whole point of the angel opening the tomb was to show that it was actually empty, even though it had seals on the door. Now, we also know that he went through the doors that were shut in the upper room to see the apostles. He stood among them, it says, on the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And then, of course, eight days later, St. Thomas is there putting his finger in the side of Christ. Once again, the doors being shut. Now, when you jump into water, the water gives way to your body, which is more dense than the water. He walked through doors that were closed. He walked through a stone wall. His body is completely glorified and repaired, except for five wounds that he's kept for victory wounds. This is a miracle. Bodies don't share the same place. Two physical bodies. This is a very high-level miracle that he could walk through doors, walk through stone walls, have a glorified body that can appear and disappear at his will. Miracle. Here's another miracle. The raising of Lazarus. It's a little lower level, but still a high level miracle. Jesus saith, take away the stone for... Martha responded to him, well, Lord, he'll be stinking by this time. It's been now four days. So he's in the tomb. It's interesting. He's wrapped up in his burial clause, which you cannot move in. So that's almost another miracle. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He cried out in a loud voice. And he must have been floating above the ground or something because you can't move in your burial clause. Now, of course, the modernists like to say, well, what happened was is that our Lord and and Lazarus got together ahead of time and said, okay, Lazarus, you go hide in that tomb over there. And in a couple of days, I'll come and say, come out. Lazarus, I'll call you by name and you come out, okay? That's the sign. And so it was a fake. That's what the modernists would say. But in fact, if he had not called out Lazarus by name, everyone would have risen from the tomb out of the dead. So much power did our Lord have. Our graveyards are full of rotting bones, Nobody's rising up from the ground. This is a miracle that someone would rise up four days after he was dead. And then one more from our Lord, the healing of the leper. The man came to him and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make us me clean. He was a leper. Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou made clean. And forthwith his leprosy was cleansed instantly. Same with Lazarus coming out of the tomb. Lazarus, come forth instantly. He rises up, comes out of the tomb. When he said, pour water into these six jars, they were instantly turned into wine. When he was on the sea and it was rough and they were getting ready to drown, he said, be calm, and it was calm instantly. Miracle. These are miracles. These are things that we need to look into. What's going on here? Besides, we know our Lord also said that these weren't just for him, but they're for us too. Thus he said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, he that believeth in me, the works that I do, he also shall do, and greater than these shall he do, and he shall do them instantly. I think that's a very important point about our Lord's miracles. They were done with no time intervening. So a miracle, let's go to the Latin root of the word. Let's try to get our mind around what a miracle is. From the Latin, it's where it comes from. 
It stands for something causing us to marvel or be filled with awe and wonder. When you see a miracle, you're, oh, wow, wonderful, marvelous. And they're called signs. They're called marvels, prodigies, wonders. But we can ask ourselves, well, what does it take to, for something to be a miracle? Let's look into a couple of possibilities of what it means, at least in modern way of thinking perhaps, what does it mean to be miraculous? What's a miracle? Well, for some, it's just an amazing product. That's the carnival line. Carnival miracle. Well named. Carnival. Carne. Carne. Flesh. Yeah, miracle. You can have some, uh, some, uh, perfume. That's a miracle whip. Of course, you know all about that. The first miracle drugs. Sulfa and penicillin. Miracle. What about the wonders of the world? People think they're miraculous. How could they possibly build those pyramids or or those uh, statues on Easter Island and the amazing Colosseum in Rome and, wow, the Wall of China, the Great Wall of China. Is that a miracle? Well, how about something just extraordinary? There's a beautiful film called The Miracle of Life. It's amazing. It tracks life from its conception all the way until its birth. It truly is a wonderful film. But is it a miracle? We're all in here together tonight. Are we each and every one of us a miracle in that way? Are we a miracle? Don't get me wrong. I mean, life's beautiful. Little babies are awesome. Truly, this is an amazing film. It's showing the life starting from the beginning to end. You see the progression. How about that jet that crashed not too long ago in the Hudson? hit a flock of geese. Next thing you know, he had no engines. And so he made a quick decision and landed in the Hudson. Miracle, we might say. Everybody survived. No one was hurt. Well, then we have recently the 2014 Synod on the Family in Rome. They came out with this statement, perhaps thinking that so many marriages are struggling today that we're being told that a faithful marriage is almost miraculous. They said, quote, conjugal love is one of the most beautiful of all miracles and the most common, end quote. Is conjugal love truly a miracle? One has to ask ourselves these questions, trying to figure out just what is a miracle. Some think that miracles are of man's choosing. New Age movement is basically at root Put your mind to it. You're a God. You will work miracles. And so they go and take these courses on miracles and they start to do things that they think are miraculous. And if they don't think they're miraculous, well then just change your way of thinking. A miracle is only a shift in consciousness. Maybe you can work miracles after all. It just depends on your definition. This particular individual is extremely dangerous. He gets most of his inspirations at 3 a.m. from probably you know who. Um, he says, I am realistic. I expect miracles. Put your mind to it. You can work a miracle. You just, you don't realize you're a God. There's all kinds of people who claim they've done miracles or are miracle workers. You have false miracles. St. Paul said that there will come a time when, when we'll have antichrist figures who will do lying wonders. Now the devil, crafty as he is, with permission from God, can set up and take away blockages to make it seem like a cure has taken place. So if someone opens themselves up to the occult or the diabolic, which Alexandra Romanov did, She did seek um, occult sources, trying to figure out how she could have a boy. Then once she had a boy, handsome young man, everybody loved him. He was very lovable. But he had hemophilia. And every time he suffered from hemophilia, she would call in Grigory Rasputin, who was a faith healer. He would bless him and pray over him, and each time Alexei got better, and it seemed miraculous, especially due to the nearness of death that had happened once or twice. 
So he's close to death. Rasputin comes in and blesses him and prays over him and he gets better. But it's really important to understand that Alexei was never cured of hemophilia and required a very long recovery period at times. Sometimes shorter, but always long. In other words, it wasn't overnight, but months. Is this truly a miracle? What were the results of this, by the way? Rasputin was able to worm his way into the royal family. He was able to influence them. Because of that, suspicion was cast upon the royal family and those on both sides, the liberals, the communists, and the royalists suspected Rasputin as being an enemy of their cause. And so the the royalists killed him. They both saw him as a problem and they both used Rasputin to attack the Romanov, the, the royal family. With Rasputin's death, it was like the first shot fired in the Russian Revolution. Everything got quiet with the death of Rasputin. And it wasn't long before the royal family was arrested and put off on the sideline and finally killed. Interesting, isn't it? So this man who wormed his way in with lying wonders ultimately helped usher in, willy-nilly, the Communist Revolution of 1917. How about Jim Jones? Jim Warren Jones, Jonestown fame. He's an interesting fella. He committed suicide in 1978 using a pistol. He researched many people's lives. He started out in Indianapolis and he researched many people's lives. He had lots of friends and they'd do studies on these people and know exactly what they were doing with their lives. Then he'd get notes and he'd hold them in his hand and he'd have dark glasses on. He always wore dark glasses, sometimes darker than that. And he could read without people seeing his eyes were looking at his notes. And then he'd tell people all about themselves and they were shocked. How did he know that? He must be a prophet. He also had fake and pretended healings. Some even claimed that he had real healings. They were so effective. He did not invoke the holy name, not once as far as I know when he claimed to do these healings. He just said, cancer be gone. And he'd have his nurses, who were legitimate nurses, come up with a towel that was filled with chicken livers that were regurgitated. Then they'd hold the towel up and look, there's your cancer. He tricked them into thinking that the cancer had come out of them in the towel. One time he had people close their eyes and he had jars of water in front of them and then they'd quickly remove them and put wine there and they open up and Jim Jones turned water into wine. He's our savior. And so they followed him down into South America. One of the things he did, there's one fella that was out in the woods walking and wondered about him. This is, he was far away. And he mentioned him somehow, was thinking about him, and then he comes home and he said, well, we were talking about you this day. You were the subject of conversation. Well, that's not anything miraculous. The devil can do that. He hears the words. He immediately goes tell his friend, another demon, is hanging around Jim Jones. They can move at the speed of thought, so he's there instantly. Jim Jones can bring up this guy and talk about him. That's not miraculous. But still, it looks miraculous. And that's why I mentioned Macbeth. Shakespeare's Macbeth explains that very well. These three witches tell Macbeth what's going on across the country, and then it comes true what they said. He comes to find out what they said were true, and then he's hooked, and he starts to do what the witches told him to do. It's interesting. What were the results of Jim Jones? Some of you were certainly alive at that time, and remember, the results were revolutionary suicide. These are not accurate. He actually killed up to a thousand people this way. Nearly 1,000 lives were taken by Jim Jones in 1978. He didn't drink the suicide poison himself. He took a gun and put it to his head. Is this man a purveyor of miracles? Well, what are miracles then? Miracles are from God. Strictly speaking, a miracle is an event perceivable by the senses. We can sense it with our senses. We don't need anything else. 
And they're caused by God alone outside of the ordinary course of created nature. They require a creative act that only God can do. Now, He can use instruments like water, human beings, and whatnot, but the actual miraculous thing is done by God alone. Miracles are inexplicable by science of all ages and times. They will never explain them ever as long as the world exists. No matter how developed science becomes, it cannot answer miracles. It is impossible. It is outside of their realm of knowledge. Because they cannot be accomplished by any natural power covered by the natural sciences. So we could make a distinction between capital M miracles and little m miracles. Okay, landing a jet in the Hudson, it's an amazing thing. That's a pretty good feat. It's miraculous in a natural way. It doesn't normally happen like that. But it's not a capital M miracle, one that only God can do outside of the ordinary course of created nature. Other jet pilots have done similar things without too much difficulty. Okay, the devil can work only natural miracles. Miracles that are within nature, created nature, the universe. Lying wonders, but he cannot work capital M miracles. Maybe this will help you understand a little better. If we look at this inner circle, this is where we are able to work. This is nature as we know it. Okay, this is all the things that we as humans can understand and work on and work with. Okay? Devils are a little more powerful than we are. They can work in this area beyond our ability. Their power extends beyond ours. We call that the preternatural. That just means beyond nature. Beyond nature. Nature? Beyond nature. Supernatural means it's above nature. Only God can work there. So miracles, as we're talking about here tonight, happen in this area. Lying wonders happen here. Now, another thing to understand is that there are some miracles that happen in here. So, for example, somebody might get well, but they might get well more quickly than the doctors expect. Like, it should take two months to recover, and they're recovered in two weeks. And they're like, wow, how did that happen? That's not strictly a miracle out here, but it could be something within here. And this is why the church, generally speaking, throughout time has not considered those sorts of healings or miracles um, to be capital and miracles. Because we're not sure. So, the miracles that Christ worked as reported in the Gospels, they surpass physical nature, meaning they're outside of this boundary. This is the created universe. This is our place in the universe. The miracles that Christ worked, as reported in the Gospels, surpass the powers of physical nature. Jesus walked on the waters. He calmed the storm at sea by a single word. He restored the sight of the blind, beached to the mute, and even raised the dead, Lazarus from the grave. No one can reasonably explain these prodigies as merely natural. They were immediately recognized by those who witnessed them as exceeding the powers of mere nature. St. Augustine comes to our aid. He says that when God does anything against the order of nature, which we know and are accustomed to observe, we call it a miracle. And I think we can say there he's even speaking of preternatural. In other words, outside of the created universe, God alone. So let's see. Now, miracles are not a product of anything in this world or an amazing achievement as miracles are only produced by God's direct intervention. So they're not something of this world. They're not necessarily extraordinary. This is important to understand as they could happen frequently or be continuous and still be miraculous. Padre Pio, 50 years, had the stigmata. Every single day, people were living with him and seeing it. It really wasn't that extraordinary, was it? But it sure was surprising. 
True miracles are always surprising. They're unexplainable by any natural causes. And finally, miracles are not from man or his choices, his desires, his schemes, but are from God's choosing, God's will. He decides, not us, to intervene directly outside the normal course of nature. Three basic levels of miracles. Miracles are measured not by their rarity, but by the degree they depart from the ordinary course of nature. The more they depart, the more miraculous. The more the power of nature is surpassed, the greater the miracle. Okay, so we started out with the miracle of Christ rising from the dead, walking through walls. That's what St. Thomas, this is from St. Thomas Aquinas, that's what he would call a substantial miracle. Totally exceed the power of the nature in the very substance of the thing done. So, two bodies occupying the same place. Walking through a closed door. Why do we have doors? Because they're very effective in keeping people on that side or people on this side. If someone's going to walk through the door, what's the use of having a door for? People don't walk through doors. This is a miracle of the highest level. Subjective miracles, number two, are within the power of nature to perform, but not in this particular subject. So, for example, nature causes life. It's not a miracle that a baby's born or conceived. This is very natural. But not in a dead body. Nature can't do anything in a dead body. It's dead. It can just fall apart and rot. So this is a subjective miracle. And then finally, the modal miracle, just mode, the manner, are within the power of nature to perform in a particular subject, but not in this manner, in this mode, in this way. So, for example, nature can cause a feverish man to regain his health, but not instantly. doesn't happen instantly. That's impossible. Let's look at some of these miracles. There's one of the highest level miracles. The miracle of the sun. Everybody knows this one. October 13, 1917. Pre-announced, prefigured. It was pre-announced months ahead of time. It was prefigured in every single apparition of Our Lady at Fatima. The sky got a little darker. Stars could be seen at midday. It was pre-announced, prefigured. 70,000 people were there to witness it. Many of them were hostile. Many were scoffers. It's one of the mark of a true miracle is that you'll have scoffers around who cannot deny it. Others saw it from a distance, so it wasn't just a local phenomena of a psychological nature. We were all hypnotized. No, you weren't, because I was three miles away and had nothing to do with it, and I saw it. No eye damage to those who were present. Clouds parted. The rain stopped immediately. Water-soaked ground and clothing completely dried. And apparently to some reports, even their clothing was clean afterwards. No mud. It lasted for 12 minutes. They counted the minutes. Miracle. That's one of the highest level miracles in the history of the world even. For 70,000 witnesses. In other words, Fatima must be pretty important. You have to look back in time a long ways to find its, its peer, its equal. The Red Sea. We have to go back that far. That's how powerful Fatima really is. Something's going on here, huh? Interesting. God works miracles for a reason. He wants you to look at something. The tilma. December 12th, that's tomorrow, 1531. The tilma is a fascinating, fascinating reality. Its temperature is 98.6 degrees. The tilma is at life temperature. One doctor put his stethoscope below the black band, which symbolizes pregnancy, for the Aztecs. They put a telescope over her womb 
and he detected a rhythmic beat of 115 pulses per minute, the same as that of a baby in a maternal womb. The rough material of the tilma has a lifespan of no more than 20 to 30 years, and some centuries ago, a replica of the image was painted on an identical piece of cactus fiber cloth, and it disintegrated after several decades after very careful care was given to it. So it lasted longer than 20, 30 years. That's the best they could do. Science cannot explain why this particular cactus fiber has not disintegrated. That's when you know you got a miracle because science says, I don't know. I can't explain it. There's no way to explain it. And that's right, because God's involved. Completely unprotected for the first 130 years of its existence. It was not protected. It didn't have any glass in front of it. It endured countless human contact and continual presence of burning candles and soot and radiation and humidity, dust and nitrous fumes from a corrosive, undrained marshland nearby. The backside is rough as is expected from cactus fiber cloth, whereas the front is smooth as silk. Miracle! There's more. There's no sign of paint on the tilma. From the distance of three to four inches, the image, one can see only the cactus fibers of material. You see through the image somehow. And you see the cactus. The colors disappear. Scientific studies have not been able to discover the origin of the coloration, nor the way the image was painted. They cannot detect vestiges of brush strokes or any other painting technique. No sizing, no preparation, in other words. No sketches. Nothing. There's no cracking, there's no peeling, there's no fading. Colors have lost none of their illuminosity. NASA scientists confirm that the paint material does not belong to any known element on Earth. They're good for something, NASA. <laughs> now, when the material was examined under a laser ray, it was shown that there was no coloration on the front or the back of the cloth and that the colors hover at a distance of three-tenths of a millimeter. It's a very fine distance, but it's hovering over the tilma. They're floating. Such a painting is unheard of in the art world, inexplicable and unrepeatable. No amount of scientific analysis can account for all its mysterious properties. It must have a supernatural origin. What's God saying? Don't be an iconoclast. Her eyes. Eyes contract and dilate when exposed to light. The cornea is curved exactly like a human eye, impossible on a two-dimensional surface. Scientists discovered that eyes of Blessed Mary have three, uh, three refractive characteristics of a human eye. She's like characteristics, she has them all. In the eyes of Blessed Mary, only about a third of an inch in size, minuscule human figures were discovered that no artist could have painted. Using digital technology, the images in the eyes were enlarged many, many times, revealing what appears to be Juan Diego opening his tilma in front of Bishop Zumaraga. The size on the scene, one-fourth of a millimeter. There's many more wonders about Blessed Mother there and that tilma. You can see the little figures there. There's stars, the constellations are on there, as well as the mountains of Mexico. Now, miracles surrounding the temple. There's many miracles, but here's two. In the year 1791, muriatic acid was accidentally spilled on the upper right side of the tilma during the period of 30 days. Without any special treatment, the affected fabric reconstituted itself miraculously. In the year 1921, a man, Freemason, concealed a high-power bomb in a flower arrangement and placed it at the feet of the tilma. The explosion destroyed everything around it except for the tilma, which remained completely intact and unharmed. In fact, there's another miracle. These guys tried to walk away with it, but it got heavier as they went away, and they couldn't hold it up any longer. <laughs> the miraculous cure of Gemma di Giorgi. Maybe you know this one. She was born on December 25th, Christmas, 1939, in Sicily. Born without pupils. A relative who was a nun advised the family to seek out Pachapio, 
Her advice gave the family a ray of hope. Gemma's grandmother asked the nun to write a letter to Padre Pio on Gemma's behalf. When the nun returned to her convent, she wrote to St. Padre Pio, asking him to pray for Gemma. One night, the nun saw him in a dream. Padre Pio asked her, Where is this Gemma for whom so many prayers are being offered that they are almost deafening? In her dream, she introduced Gemma to Padre Pio, and he made the sign of the cross on her eyes. The next day, the nun received a letter from Padre Pio in the mail, which he wrote, Dear daughter, rest assured that I will pray for Gemma. I send you my best wishes. The nun was struck by the coincidence of the dream and the letter that followed so closely. She wrote to the family and encouraged them to take Gemma to see Padre Pio. So in 1947, the grandmother took seven-year-old Gemma to San Giovanni Rotondo to see Padre Pio, praying and hoping all the while for a miracle. On the trip there, Gemma's eyesight began mysteriously to function. At San Giovanni Rotondo, Padre Pio called Gemma by name before the child was ever presented to him. He heard her confession, and even though she made no mention of her blindness, he touched her eyes with the wounded part of his hand, tracing the sign of the cross. At the end of the confession, as he blessed her, he said, Be good and saintly. The same day, Padre Pio gave Gemma her first Holy Communion and again made the sign of the cross over each of her eyes. Was she cured? Pon, and after reaching her home in Sicily, many doctors met with her, establishing the following facts. First, Gemma was born with a severe congenital defect of the eyes. Second, before the prayers of Gemma to Padre Pio were enlisted, her vision was either quite defective or altogether non-existent. And third, afterward, though the physical structure of the eye remained unchanged, Gemma was able to see normally, even though officially classified as legally blind. Amazing, huh? And she was tested in many ways. She could count fingers and objects and describe them. She had no pupils. She's a living miracle. How about this one? This is a favorite. During World War II, some American and English pilots were ordered to bomb the area of San Giovanni Rotondo in Italy because the Nazis were there. When they were getting ready to drop the bombs, the pilots reported seeing in the air a monk who is stretching out his wounded hands prevented them from dropping their bombs. And they tried more than once. They didn't give up. Well, the, the general, Nathan F. Twining, got mad. Let me in one of those planes. I'm going to go up there and show you how to do it. He got up there and there's this monk and he had to turn and get out of there. And what happened later was is that these same guys got stationed right by San Giovanni Rotondo at an American base. And they came and said, that's the friar we saw in the air. And then Padre Pio scolded the general. <laughs> no food or drink for 13 years. Blessed Alexandrina da Costa. Let's look at St. Alexandrina, Blessed Alexandrina's life. If you don't know who she is, she was living in Fatima in 1918. She was a young girl, a teenager, and 13, I think, or 14. And her previous boss came to her house to attack her with another man. And there were three little girls in the house. And they broke into the house to attack these little girls. And Blessed Alexandrina, wanting to preserve her virginity, jumped out of the second story window and broke part of her back. She couldn't walk, but she heard her sister inside yelling and screaming. She crawled up the stairs with a stick, broken as she was. When the men saw her, they were totally aghast at what they were seeing and the bravery of this young girl, and surely the angels were at work. They took off. They ran with all their might to get out of there. She saved the day, but she remained more and more paralyzed until she became completely paralyzed lying on her bed of pain. So on March 27, 1942, Alexandrina began an absolute fast which was to last more than 13 years until her death, her sole nourishment being Holy Communion. She was a victim soul, and she received this Holy Communion every morning. 
She was a victim soul. She was suffering for the church and to symbolize the church and what she would be going through in the future. Initially, she would reject any food that she attempted to eat. In other words, she would, it would come out. She couldn't hold it down. She did not understand what was going on. She thought, well, it's my time to die. And then she didn't die. So they asked her, well, why don't you eat? I don't eat because I cannot. I feel full. I do not need it. However, I have a longing for food, but I just can't eat anything. She was isolated and tested by unfriendly doctors and nurses who refused to believe that this was some miracle. And so she was subjected to 40 days of constant round-the-clock observation and psychological torture. They tried to talk her into eating. They tried to say, oh, don't you, don't you feel like this or that? They tried to talk her into ways of thinking and acting. She ate only the sacred host once a day. Here's some of the reports from the doctors. I am certain that it is not a matter of deception because the impartial commission which observed her for 40 days and 40 nights with rigorous vigilance could verify that her abstinence from nourishment was total. She did not eat or drink a thing except the Eucharist for 40 days and 40 nights under continual observation. Poor thing. Now, the doctor writes, this abstinence from all food during such a long period of time is incompatible with life. What's it now? You can live three uh, minutes without air until you start getting in trouble. You can live three days without water until you start getting into trouble. And you can live three weeks without food until you start getting into trouble. Three, three, three. So that's what I've been taught. I don't want to try it out, but that's what it is. Now, this abstinence from all food during such a long period of time is incompatible with life and much less with the maintenance of normal temperature, respiration, pulse, blood pressure, etc., of which she showed normal levels. Her intellectual life is intense. Her relationships are perfect. Her faculties and senses are retained in an absolute manner. This extraordinary case, rather I would say exceptional case, can in no way be explained by purely natural means as through scientific data. The inflammation of the spinal cord, which is her paralytic problem, which is most probably the cause of the paralysis, has nothing to do with her abstinence from food, but merely a parallel illness. Miracle! If you haven't read her life, I recommend it. It's not that long. It's wonderful. St. Joan of Arc. Who doesn't love St. Joan of Arc? In early March 1430, as she arrived at the village of lagnier sur -Marne, marne a woman was greatly distressed over her stillborn baby. She prayed that the baby might at least come to life and be baptized. St. Joan came and added her prayers to those people that were praying with the baby lying before the statue of the Blessed Mother. And she added her prayers. I think some traditions say she even touched the baby. I'm not sure. But the baby came back to life. And it was already black and dark. It yawned three times. The priest came and gave it baptism. And then it died shortly thereafter. I believe that Mark Twain also recounts this in his book on Joan of Arc. And Mark Twain is not Catholic, and he recognized this is the real McCoy. How about raising the dead? St. Stanislaus, Polish bishop, died in 1079. There was a disputed property purchased by the church was ruled upon unjustly by the vicious King Boleslaus. I think he might have been the one who killed St. Stanislaus. I forgot to look that up. But the previous owner had died three years before. His name was Peter his family wanted the property back. You ever heard of that happening? Come on, this happens all the time. Someone gives property to somebody or to the church, and then the family, after that person dies, they enter into all these lawsuits. That's our property. He didn't really mean to give that to the church. And so they went to the king, and he ruled in their favor. And so the bishop had to turn the property back over to these people. But wait a minute, we're dealing with a saint. He asked, give me three days, please, and I'll bring a witness. Okay, you have three days. Ha, ha, ha. Good luck. So he goes out. 
with a procession, goes to the grave, dressed in full bishop's regalia, goes to where Peter had been buried three years earlier, and he digs him up, he commands him to come to life, he does, he's dressed in a cloak, brought before the king to testify on Stanislaus' behalf. The dumbfounded court heard Peter's reprimand, and he reprimanded his three children to testify that he had indeed paid for the land, that this bishop had paid for the land. It was a real deal. Unable to give any other verdict, the king dismissed the suit against the bishop. Amazing. Now you think about that. Well, Father, come on, that was back in 1079. They were more believable people back then. Yeah, against a vicious king who had every reason to make sure miracles like that didn't get spread around and continued on? No, I don't think so. That's one of the ways we know there's miracles is because there's always someone around who's vicious or unjust or scoffing that helps us believe. Think of Lazarus. The Pharisees hated him. They would have said that was a fake miracle. They didn't. They wanted to kill Lazarus after he rose from the dead because they knew it was a real thing. St. Vincent Ferrer, what a wonderful man he was. He's one of the church's greatest preachers. He could go to a city in France. He only spoke his native tongue from Spain, and it was a dialect and he could speak, people could hear him from hundreds of yards away, they could understand him perfectly in their own language. That alone was miraculous. Well, he's known to have raised 30 people from the dead. He pleaded in vain for a man wrongly condemned to death, but they wouldn't listen to him. So he was accompanying the poor man to the gallows, trying to help him die a holy death. On the way to the gallows, they met a funeral procession. Vincent seemed suddenly to have an inspiration. He stopped and addressed the dead man. You no longer have anything to gain by lying. Is this man guilty? Answer me. The dead man sat up then spoke the words, He is not. As the man began to settle down again on his stretcher, Vincent offered to reward this man for his service. He gave him the opportunity of remaining alive on earth. But the man responded, No, Father, for I am assured of my salvation. And with that, he died again as if going to sleep, and they carried off his body to the cemetery. The innocent man was saved. Who can't remember the beautiful story, the wonderful story of St. Vincent, where there was a man working on a monastery. He was looking down at St. Vincent, whom he loved, and he waved at him and fell. And he was falling off the monastery and, and St. Vincent was prevented from doing any more miracles because they were causing a stir in town. And so he said, just a moment. And the man stopped in the middle of the air and he went to a superior and asked permission if he could help this poor man. And he said, yes, you can help him. And then he went back and he brought him down. True story. St. Vincent Ferrer. He's somebody you want to know. St. Ignatius of Loyola, he died in 1555. Everybody knows St. Ignatius as the founder of the Jesuits. Well, a man hanged himself after a failed lawsuit. We haven't heard of things like that happening, right? Ignatius cut him down, the poor man, and pleaded with tears over his dead body, sorrowing that he should die in such a terrible way without the sacraments. Die by his own hand. He pronounced the name of Jesus over him. The dead man arose, expressed his sorrow, went to confession, received the sacraments, and then expired. Many such stories. St. Francis Xavier many times rose people up from the dead in India, in the Pacific Islands, and Japan to show the people the true faith is the Catholic faith, the only faith. This is how saints dialogue. They work miracles. Saint Bernadette. If you've been to Nevers, France, you'll see Saint Bernadette, little Bernadette. She's not very tall. No air cooling systems, preservative systems, no embalming. Vladimir Lenin in, in Moscow, they have to redo his body frequently and put him under a special cooling and air conditioning system to keep him 
in a sort of quasi state of incorruption. The Vatican recently pronounced that John the 23rd was embalmed. He's in a sealed coffin. He's not incorrupt. This little one is incorrupt. She has no embalming fluids. She has a wax thin, a wax mask over her though, because the nuns, as they are wont to do, washed her when they first pulled her up out of the grave in 1909, and then they pulled her up again in 1919 for her canonization or her beatification, and then they pulled her up again a third time in 1925. And the nuns, as they're wont to do, shame on them, but they washed her each time, and finally on the third washing, she started to fade a little. And because of her fading, she was so incorrupt before that, she wouldn't have needed a mask, but they put a thin wask mask because she was a little dark and parched. So anyway, she's very incorrupt. That's her rosary that rotted around her hands when she herself did not rot. Listen to some of her doctors that were there. This is from a book you can pick up, The Body of St. Bernadette. All these men swore oaths. This is the first digging up, zooming of St. Bernadette. The mouth was opened slightly, and it could be seen that the teeth were still in place. The hands were crossed on her breast, were perfectly preserved, as were the nails. The hand still held a rusting rosary. The veins on the forearms stood out. It was found that the hair which had been cut short was stuck to the head and still attached to the skull, that the ears were in a state of perfect preservation, that the left side of the body was slightly higher than the right from the hip up. And then a couple years later, when they exhumed her a third time, under oath again, all these doctors witness to these things. And the final report says, these muscles were also in a very good state of preservation and did not seem to have putrefied at all. She died in 1879. This is 1925. And everything around her was humid and rotting in the tomb. Another place, it says, what struck me during this examination, of course, was the state of perfect preservation of the skeleton the fibrous tissues of the muscles still supple and firm, of the ligaments and of the skin, and above all, the totally unexpected state of the liver after 46 years. One would have thought that this organ, which is basically soft and inclined to crumble, would have decomposed very rapidly or would have hardened to a chalky consistency. Yet when it was cut, it was soft and almost normal to consistency. I pointed this out to those present, remarking that this did not seem to be natural phenomenon. No kidding. Now, why does God work miracles? Well, to show the workings of grace. Supernatural, which comes from God. Miracles are beyond the reach of nature but not the supernatural. There is more in this world than can be seen or known naturally. That's why we have miracles. Wake up. There's more going on around here than we realize. Second of all, it's a sign that points to something like Fatima or to a person, Bernadette, or to the apparitions of Lourdes in which she was a witness. To provide reasons for our believing in someone sent by God or something God has revealed. When the senses are overwhelmed with some marvelous event, it becomes a reason, a sign to believe what cannot be seen, namely God and all that He has revealed. Thus we read in John's Gospel, many believed in His name, seeing His signs, which He did. Pope Pius X in syllabus of errors regarding modernism, he condemned the following modernist proposition. While Christ was exercising his ministry, he did not speak with the object of teaching he was the Messiah, nor did his miracles tend to prove it. What? His miracles didn't prove that he was the Messiah? Yes, they did. That's a condemned proposition. What did the man born blind say when he was cured from John chapter 9? 
From the beginning of the world, it has not been heard that any man hath opened the eyes of one born blind. So they're indispensable for credibility of our faith. Divine confirmation of what is already believed for us. The Eucharist, devotion to the Blessed Virgin, infant baptism. What's that about Joan of Arc? Little baby coming alive, getting baptized, dying again? Hello, this is about infant baptism. It's very serious. Praying the rosary, intercession of saints. Encouragement for those who do not believe to reconsider. We'll see an example of that in a moment. And Vatican I also had something to say about miracles because it's answering the rationalism of its day. When it came out in the middle of the 1800s, rationalism was the big thing. Hence, Moses and the prophets, and especially Christ our Lord Himself, worked many absolutely clear miracles. While the apostles, we read, and they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. Miracles do not cause faith. They provide reasons to believe. So, even though the Pharisees saw that Lazarus rose from the dead, they didn't believe. They can't cause faith. They give us reasons to believe. Wow, there must be a God. Now, why do some doubt miracles? Well, we have rationalism. Well, they say to themselves, well, tomorrow we may find the causes of what we think were miraculous today. So if I bring out someone from way back in the 1600s to the 1900s or the year 2000, and they see radio, they see screens like this and digital things. Wow, miracle! So they think, well, we'll find the reason for it tomorrow. We don't know today, but tomorrow we may, right? Well, the church responded at Vatican I, if anyone says that all miracles are impossible and that therefore all reports of them, even those contained in the sacred scripture, are to be set aside as fables or myths, or that miracles can never be known with certainty, nor can the divine origin of the Christian religion be proved from them, let him be anathema. The origin of Christian religion can be proved from them. That's the point. They're indispensable. Only God can work a miracle. He's going to work it for a reason. He's not going to work it for Jim Jones and Rasputin. He's going to work it for his Christ and those that are faithful to him. Now, here's the big problem we've got today. Instead of understanding the true nature of things, which requires metaphysics, which enables us to see the nature of a thing and when that nature has been surpassed, People fantasize. We're being trained to fantasize. We go to movie theaters. We watch fantasy movies. We're fantasizing all the time. And we adopt a sort of Star Trek mentality. This is a problem. Or even worse, and they don't know they're doing this a lot, but people do it. They're adopting an occult principle. Well, if you can imagine it, then it must be real. Just put your mind to it and make it happen. It must be possible somewhere, somehow. Therefore, it must be possible here. This is an occult principle. This is what's driving the Wayne Dyers of our world that wake up at three in the morning and are inspired by diabolical thoughts. Sadly, many of these people are forever seeking to tap into the secret powers of the world, which really are the preternatural forces, the occult forces. Serious. That's why there's so much occult today. People are looking into this and the devil's having a day with them. But ultimately, the reason why people don't want to believe in miracles, they want to doubt them, is why? If I believe, I'm going to have to change the way I live. That means I have to get baptized. That means I've got to go to confession. That means I've got to receive Holy Communion. That means I've got to kneel down. I've got to be humble. I gotta obey somebody besides myself. No way, not doing it. I like my life. G.K. Chesterton, he died in 1936. He had a great saying about miracles. 
My belief that miracles have happened in human history is not a mystical belief at all. I believe in them upon human evidence, as I do in the discovery of America. 70,000 people saw the miracle of the sun. What more do you want? Many of them were scoffers, haters of the Catholic Church. They saw the miracle. There's historical evidence here that is undeniable. Somehow or other, an extraordinary idea has risen that disbelievers in miracles consider them coldly and fairly, while believers in miracles accept them only in connection to some dogma. No, the fact is quite the other way around. The believers in miracles accept them rightly or wrongly only because they have evidence for them. 70,000 people. The disbelievers in miracles deny them rightly or wrongly because they have a doctrine against them. It really captures it all, doesn't it? If I believe in that, i got to change my life. My doctrine is hedonism. Forget it. I'm living it up while I can. Let's go to Lourdes. This is going to be our closing section of this talk. A very beautiful place. If you haven't been there and if you've got a chance, go. It's the most pious place on the face of the earth. You won't be disappointed. In 1858, St. Bernadette had 18 apparitions. They were very concise. They were very profound. So Lourdes is God's answer to rationalism. Rationalism is saying there's no miracles. All of a sudden, in the middle of the 1800s, Our Lady shows up in Lourdes, France to a little girl who's not very smart. And what happens? A miraculous spring is discovered. It's an instantaneous spring. The experts say it was not there before she started to dig that day. It came at that moment. It was put there by God. Now, because of all the scoffers of Lourdes, many books have been written against it. Many tricks have been tried to get Lourdes shut down. They established what is called the Lourdes Medical Bureau. Very serious. Very rigorous. The Medical Bureau is to check cures. So there's no fake things going on. No charlatanism, nothing. This is the real thing. And there's agnostic doctors on this medical bureau. They don't believe. Now, if the person comes that's sick, given that the original diagnosis has been verified and confirmed beyond doubt, uh, the team of doctors at the medical bureau lists five musts before considering a cure to be indisputably miraculous. These are awesome. And God fulfills these on a semi-regular basis. Absence of a curative agent. In other words, they're not taking any miracle drugs, right? No special drugs, no drugs at all. They're done with that. None of those things worked. No special treatments. Instantaneous. Suppression of convalescence. No residual impairment or deficit. We'll talk about each of these. Irregularity of the method of healing. This is really interesting. And then finally, the function restored without action of their organ still incapable of accomplishing it. We'll talk about that. This is like Gemma. You got an eye that can see, but it doesn't have pupils. So the organ is working, but it doesn't have the ability to accomplish the function it's called to accomplish. <laughs> it's missing something. Wow! Miracle! Here's number one. Absence of a curative agent. The only curative agent is this miraculous spring. Our Lady said, go and drink at the fountain. If you go to the grotto, they got it covered up in a little glass there, circle. That's what the spring looks like. And then, of course, you can fill up your bottle in a little spigot down the way. Stand in line sometimes. Instantaneous. The healing of arteries, we say, according to the laws of biology, healing of arteries requires 40 to 50 days. That of a nerve entirely severed three or four months, at least, to heal and recover its lost function. 
For broken bone to knit 30 to 60 days, depending on the thickness of the bone and the extent of the fracture. At Lord's, they're all repaired in little or no time at all. They're repaired instantly. Listen to this doctor. He says, the laws of biology that we have studied have taught us that all the work of organic recuperation requires to be perfect is what? Time and slowness. And here, all at once, these laws are completely set aside. That which ought to have required a month of attentive care, even granting it might be successful, occurs instantaneously, perfectly, and permanently, without any apparent intervention of any kind. Microbes are annihilated. Carcinomas vanish. Tuberculo, bacilli, exist no more. Gangrenous bones are reformed. Severed nerves join together. Wounds are healed. Sometimes this happens in a few seconds, sometimes in a few hours, but so rapidly that we can say that the factor time has disappeared. Consequently, the cure has operated beyond the laws of biology. Let's take an example. How about, there's many, but here's a couple. Elizabeth Delo. Mademoiselle Delo was a teacher in a girls' school at Boulogne. In her late 40s, she became seriously ill, so ill that she had to give up her work and go into the hospital. X-rays and clinical tests brought the terrible news that she had cancer of the stomach. Besides, bismuth test shows that there was a block between the stomach and the beginning of the intestine. This meant death by starvation unless surgery could affect the passage of food. When the surgeon who performed the operation saw the condition, he told Miss Delo, attending physician, that the size of the tumor was such that he could not do anything to remove it. All he could do was to make an opening from the stomach into the intestine, which would permit the food to pass into the lower digestive tract. This was done. And at first, there seemed to be a slight improvement. But after three months, the trouble became worse. The original cancer of the stomach had spread to the liver, and the operated opening itself was invaded by cancerous cells. In July, the blockage was complete. Eating became impossible for the penitent. This was before they had feeding tube. Even liquids could not be kept down. Physicians agreed there was nothing ahead but the misery of constant hunger and thirst until death. Mademoiselle Delot was lost. In this desperate state, she joined the Lord's pilgrimage. Arriving on Lord's July 30th, she was so exhausted after the journey, they put her into the water at the piscine, that's the bath, with extraordinary precautions. So she went right into the bath. Her first sensation was of pain so intense that she cried out with all her strength for death to deliver her. She felt a terrible burning and stabbing in the stomach and intestine, as if she said afterwards, they were holding her under a fiendish hammer. But then the nurses helped her out of the water. The agony gave way to an unaccustomed sense of well-being. A strange feeling of calm and health took possession of her. Also an unexpected vigor. She dressed herself without assistance. At the same time, she felt a strong sensation of hunger, unknown to her in a long time. Back at the hostel, she ate some food, some soup, and some vegetable puree without feeling any discomfort. That night, she ate some meat and felt nothing but a renewal of strength. The next day, a repetition of the same diet confirmed the cure. The intestine emptied itself normally. Now, wait a minute. If you've ever studied people who've been in prison camps that are starving. This happened in World War II. The American Red Cross came over and dumped a whole bunch of parcels of food for these people. And they had like Vienna sausages and stuff in there. And these people were starving. And they're out there devouring this wrong food. Many of them just started to die one after the other from digestive problems. You just can't go and eat meat if you haven't used your intestines for months and years. She was eating meat and fine. Wow. 
18 doctors looked her over and we're all going, whoa, miracle. She remained in excellent health. Now, here's another one. Marie-Louise Arnaud. She was a devout Catholic, knowing from a human point of view that her case was lost. So she decided to go on the national pilgrimage. What happened to Marie-Louise? She was instantly cured of a disseminated sclerosis while lying on her stretcher in front of the grotto. This disease, generally called incurable, is caused by patches of inflammation occurring in different portions of the brain or spinal cord. It often begins with weakness in the limbs and later come muscular incoordination and wavering eyesight. The patches spread and the disease is usually fatal. When Mademoiselle Arnaud, the first symptoms appeared with pains in the legs. Frequently, she was falling to the ground for no apparent reason. She had violent headaches and an ability to use her hands properly. She could no longer sew or knit. Her writing became almost indecipherable, reading more and more difficult. And so her doctors said that there was nothing they could do. And so she went to Lourdes. After reaching Lourdes, she was so ill that on the second day she was taken only to the procession in the afternoon. Being carried there on a stretcher increased her giddiness. She'd open her eyes and she'd get sick. She seemed to be very near the end. August 23rd was the anniversary of her brother's death. She begged to be taken to the grotto that morning, wishing to offer up her communion for her brother. When the priest mounted the pulpit, he asked that the sick should try to forget their own sufferings for a few minutes and to pray for the dead. Mademoiselle Arnaud was struck by the coincidence and began to pray earnestly. After she had received the communion, she wept quietly, thinking of their brother she had loved so much, thinking of him. And as she records, quite oblivious of myself and my illness, turning her head on her pillow to hide her tears, I was astonished to feel quite distinctly the shape of my right slipper resting on my left foot, for sensation had been so completely dulled by my illness. I opened my eyes. Before me, everything was steady, where before everything seemed to oscillate and wobble about. I could see clearly. All this happened in a lightning flash, while the sacred host was still on my tongue. With my fingers, I could say my rosary. I sat up without falling over to the right or the left, as usually happened. Sensation had returned to my legs and my limbs now seemed to obey my will. She was cured. She got up and she walked. Instantaneous. Instantaneous, folks. Keep that in mind. That's something we've lost. Absence of convalescence. After the disease is expelled, they get up, they eat, they work, they recover their weight, even up to two pounds per day. We're trying to lose pounds per day. They're gaining two pounds per day. That's a lot. No physical therapy needed. No dangers in eating after long fast. I am hungry is one of the first things that is said. I'm cured. I am hungry. Feed me. Isn't that amazing? There's the baths. I think the men come in here and there's like two or three lines for the women. There's always more of them than the men. They're more willing. Let's look at a few cures of absence of convalescence. No matter what the affliction or degree of acuteness of chronic condition, it is immediately that all of the organic functions, digestion, breathing, circulation, and so on, are restored to normal vigor. The function of digestion and assimilation is, a, is first to get back into order. The astonishment of the invalid is amazed at a sudden imperious hunger. I am hungry, once again, is the major, major uh, repeated thing. Listen to this one, a little, little Andre. His name is Henry. He was a boy of seven who came to Lord's dying of a serious digestive ailment. Henry was quite a little boy, highly intelligent, but always delicate from the time when he was a year old. He began to suffer from an illness that nearly killed him, enteritis, or inflammation of the intestines, as was diagnosed by three different doctors. He had been in bed for two years, refusing almost all food but milk and in acute pain most of the time. 
While his brothers ran and shouted outside, he lay helpless in agony. One doctor described what happened to him over this two-year period. Severe abdominal pain, night sweats, blood in the stools, of which six or seven a day, extreme anemia, the loss of weight, all pointing to classic tubercular symptoms as well as immediate digestive miseries. He weighed only 28 pounds when he came to Lourdes, where he weighed 42 only 18 months earlier. 28 pounds, people. Unbelievable. He came to Lourdes. He looked like a dying person, a skeleton, very thin, and eats less and less. His parents took him to Lourdes like so many others as a last desperate hope. During this time there, his condition, far from improving, seemed to only grow worse. The trip itself was very hard. It was 300 miles in a third-class carriage. And on the night after their arrival, his mother thought he was dying, wheeling him about on his stretcher to the various ceremonies, plunging him into the icy water at the piscine, might certainly have killed a child in his condition. And on Tuesday, the day set for the return journey, the mother cried her heart out as she looked at the wasted little body and admitted despairingly, he's no better. It has all been for nothing. I know now that he will die. He seemed unconscious after they got him into the train. He lay back on his pillows, white and spent. One of the nurses on the train later wrote the following account to the medical bureau. The train departed. After taking a last look at the Virgin as we passed above the grotto, the nurses and patients began to recite the rosary. They could not finish it without real emotion, for it was during our rosary at the grotto that the little Sajet girl, a POTS disease victim, had been cured. When the recitation was finished, little Henri, motionless on his mattress up to that moment, suddenly sat up and said, I want to see that little girl who was cured. I want to see her right now. He stepped down on the floor. His mother, stupefied, began to laugh and cry all together. I want to see that little girl who was cured, insisted Henry. Now, right away, at once. And here he is, standing up, walking, followed by one of the nurses, ready to hold him up if he needs be. Very well, come, she said soothingly, and he walked the length of the corridor. This child, who had not stirred from his mattress for 18 months, when he reached the compartment of the little girl, he threw his arms around her, and the two little children hugged each other joyfully. By this time, everybody in the car was in the corridor, laughing and crying with the mother, and giving thanks to the Blessed Virgin who had wrought this double miracle. After things had quieted down, Henry went back to his own compartment, and for the first time in several years, he said that he was hungry. His mother gave him first a little milk, but that was not sufficient. They gave him a, a banana and a bowl of hot chocolate, which went down very well. Two hours later, for supper, he ate two slices of bread and some pâté. Not exactly something you'd want to eat on an empty stomach that's very sick. The diet certainly indicated not for intestinal disease. Next morning, when he woke up, he ate three sweet rolls and a cup of black coffee. And then he was hungry and ate again before he reached the destination. He was instantly cured. With no period of convalescence afterwards, or any interim condition. From the day of his return home, he shared the family meals, which were very substantial. His digestive functions were entirely normal. It was, said the doctors, a complete restoration of the entire digestive tract. One more of this, Ernestine Guiteau. This girl, age 24, this is an amazing story, 24, arrived at Lourdes with a certificate saying for three years she had suffered from tuberculosis peritonitis. She suffered horribly, took no food at all, and was kept going with injections. For two years, she had only had a little milk, tea, or coffee, often thrown up for the most part. A living skeleton. She weighed 48 pounds at 24 years old on her arrival at Lourdes. 
She was unconscious most of the time and death was declared imminent. The sisters at the hospital were so sure that she was soon to be dead, they showed her mother the cell where her dead body could be laid. But Ernestine was not in need of it. During the passing of the Blessed Sacrament at the grotto, the morning after her arrival, this living skeleton suddenly raised itself. She got up from her stretcher, walking unaided, and followed the procession into the Rosary Church. The crowd looked on dumbfounded. Then a resounding Magnificat broke out. Ernestine was taken to the medical bureau where 15 doctors examined her. They found no trace of lesions. The abdomen, which was swollen, had become supple. There was no pain whatever, and she was ravenously hungry and was able to eat and digest any food. Before her cure, she had been unable to move without excruciating pain. Now she walked and moved with perfect ease. She had been in bed for two years, but the muscles and fat were restored with a rapidity that was abnormal. When you're in bed for two years, you can't get around and move. Your body is atrophied. Your muscles are atrophied. She returned to Lourdes a year later on a pilgrimage, giving thanks, having gained 66 pounds. Absence of convalescence. For people who have been sick, wow, that's a great one. Irregularity of method. Few are cured in the same way. Some are cured in the baths with no pain, as we've heard. Others with pain, right? They scream, but they're cured. Some are cured on the first day. Others only after a few days of the baths. Some are cured at the grotto, receiving Holy Communion. Others during benediction. And still, as we've heard, others are cured on the train home. These, the doctors say, are some of the mysteries peculiar to miraculous cures and marking them as definitively the outside the scientific law which operates always uniformly, universally, and forever the same under the same conditions. Okay? Interesting, huh? Go and tell the priest to have a chapel bill here. Now you can see why. Because we need it for the Blessed Sacrament to be processed. Many cures have been worked because of the procession. People receiving Holy Communion. Build a chapel. You need the Lord. He's going to work a miracle. Finally, number five, functions restored without an organ. As we saw with Gemma di Giorgi, the function of seeing can be accomplished miraculously without the organ working. No pupils. The cure happens. Then the organ sometimes has to catch up later. Here's a, an example. is Madame Bire, who was blind for many months. The nerves of her eyes were completely atrophied. Yet after the miraculous moment at the grotto, Madame Bure saw well enough to read the finest print. Months before, the optic nerves had regained their normal aspect. The doctors examined her. She was able to see, they said, when organically she had no right to see. In other words, they said she was seeing with dead eyes. How is that possible? Miracle. The case of Guy. He was even more spectacular. Here's a child in a state of complete idiocy for two and a half years suddenly became able to think and act with a brain at least partially destroyed following acute meningoencephalitis. He was thinking with a brain that could not think, just as Madame Biret was seen with eyes that could not see. Functions were restored without the organ. Nobody, no doctor on earth can deny that there is a miracle here. Two more miracles. This one, Jean Fretel. She did not have good health as a youngster. In 1938 and 1946, she had seven operations for tuberculosis peritonitis. She was given up for lost after 1946. In 1947, she came, or she was actually on morphine quite a bit, trying just to kill the pain. That's all she had left was just basically killing the pain. She had 103 to 104 oscillating temperature regularly. But on August 1948, she became more and more exhausted. She could only take small quantities of liquid. She was down to 96 pounds. 
Signs of meningitis appeared. The abdomen was very swollen and painful. Pus flowed abundantly in the stools, also in the vomit. She was obviously dying. Accompanied by black blood, all hope seemed to be lost. Arriving at Lourdes Tuesday, the 5th of October, I think this is 1948, she was taken next day to the Mass at the Grotto and to the Baths with no improvement. Nothing could be noticed. On Friday morning, October 8th, she was carried dying to the Mass of the sick at the altar of St. Bernadette. The priest hesitated to give her Holy Communion because of her constant vomiting and her extreme weakness. But her stretcher bearer insisted and he gave her a bit of the consecrated host. It was then, said John, that suddenly I felt well and I became aware that I was at Lourdes. She was so drugged up, she didn't even know where she was. They asked me how I felt. I replied, I felt very well. My abdomen was still hard and swollen, but I was not suffering at all. They gave me a cup of a cafe au lait, which I drank gratefully and which I kept down. And then she went to the grotto and the tumor disappeared. I mean, she went to the, the waters and she bathed and the tumor disappeared. And then she ate very, very well. Food was brought to her and she ate good appetite with veal with puree and three pieces of bread. She had not enjoyed such a meal in ten years. When I had eaten it all, I still was hungry and I asked for more. They brought me much again and still I wanted more. Then for dessert, they gave me a dish of rice pudding. I felt fine. She's a famous cure. Jean Fratel. She's still alive, by the way, as far as I know. And she gave her life over to help the, the incurables. The effects of Lord's cures were drawing close to the end, keeping here a while. The cured are most notably humbled. They're not proud or smug. They dedicate their lives to the church, often becoming nurses of the incurables. The faith of their families and their friends and relatives are increased. Conversion and penance of non-believers happens. A story of Madam A. Madam A had a fibroid tumor. By the way, Pope Pius XII, talking about lords more than once, in one of his documents, Fulgens Corona, number four, says that by these Miracles at Lourdes, God was saying in very clear ways, the Catholic Church is the only true religion. Why does God give these miracles? He's saying, look at Lourdes. What's Lourdes? It's about a lady. Her name is Mary. She's the immaculate conception. She just verified the infallibility of the Pope who defined the immaculate conception four years earlier. This is the real religion. It has a pope. It has a mother. Madam A had a fibroid tumor. She had been ill for 12 years. The tumor in her uterus had grown to enormous proportions, even weighing possibly up to 20 pounds, and it pressed all the weight against her intestines, and it was inoperable. So she was going to die. She could not eat properly, and she was steadily getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and she could only take liquid food and only two cups that a day. Through weakness, she even lost her voice. Because of the pressure on her intestine, her time was drawing to a close. Vomiting was continual. The case had reached a desperate and apparently hopeless stage. As a last resort, Madame A decided to go to Lourdes. The doctor said, you won't even last that long. You won't make it. But she had a double reason for wanting to make the pilgrimage. She had a neighbor, a retired railroad employee, who was complete unbeliever and who laughed at the idea of a cure through divine intervention, especially a cure for such a malady. He said, if Madam A is cured at Lourdes, I'll become a believer myself. And I will walk barefoot through the streets of Creon, carrying a penitential candle. Now Madame A heard this and was deeply stirred. Profound believer, she became more eager for the conversion of her neighbor than for her own cure. She says, I must go. Perhaps the Blessed Virgin will cure him. She made the journey on a mattress at the limit of her strength and very close to death. Four injections were necessary just to keep her heart going during the trip. 
On August 21st, she was taken to the piscine, the, the baths, on a stretcher. During the brief instant of her immersion, she felt excruciating pain, and then the pressure of her abdomen seemed to disappear. She felt no pain at all, no stress. She was taken back to the hospital. She took no nourishment, either solid liquid. Again, at 4 p.m., she was carried on a stretcher to the procession, lined up in, with her companions in misery. She suffered terribly while waiting for the pass in the Blessed Sacrament. But at that precise moment, as the host was raised above her, sufferings vanished, it seemed, her energies were reborn, and she could get up and walk. So the combination of the bath and the procession, she was completely cured. Her abdomen was entirely flat. Apparently, everything was normal, and once again, a whole team of doctors looked at her and made all the measurements and couldn't believe it. She had to have new clothes to go home. The neighbors fulfilled his vow. He walked barefoot through the street of their little town, carrying a candle like any sincere penitent, and became a firm, practicing Catholic. Madame A's joy was then complete. So... It's to help all these people convert if they have a mind for it. Now let's just finish with the role of science. A couple of slides. From Lord's Medical Bureau, which is rigorous and filled with skeptical doctors, we see that the miracles happen first. Then we investigate them. Everybody sees them. There's a big lump on this woman's uh, uterus in her belly, and it's gone. Science comes to the aid of the church to declare no natural explanation can be found. What happened here is outside of the laws of biology. It's outside of the laws of nature. But I propose to you that we're now in a reversal, which shouldn't surprise anybody here who understands what's going on. Once again, a miracle is an event that's perceivable immediately by the senses. It's caused by God alone outside of the ordinary course of nature. They are inexplicable by science of all ages and times. Now, however, we're being presented with miracles from situations where people are not quite sure they're cured. Maybe over a couple of months or a year, they realize they're cured, but they're not sure. Wait a minute. Perceivable immediately by the senses. What happened to that? Science has to tell them so. Now science takes the leading role. Such miracles are not immediate but gradual, which is hand in glove with modern evolution-style thinking. They want these gradual miracles. It takes years to determine if a miracle has happened. They're often not perceived immediately, if at all, by the senses. Scientific instruments must be relied upon. We have to have x-rays and MRIs and all these machines that tell us, well, it seems that this no longer is a problem you've got. Oh, okay, good, thanks. I'm glad to hear that. Wait a minute. When that girl came out of the waters, I'm cured. Bang! And everybody said, miracle! A 28-pound boy who was seven years old gets up, I want to hug this girl. Where is she? Miracle! Folks, we're in trouble. We've lost that sense of miracle. We're canonizing and beatifying people on these gradual things. We've never considered miracles before. I'm not saying they weren't cured. What I'm saying is the church has not proposed these kinds of miracles for us to believe in before. She's always proposed these miracles for canonizations, beatifications. I think we're in trouble. Science has taken the leading position. We're in the situation where we've got these sort of rational miracles. We think about it and we say, oh, miracle. This way of proceeding is a subtle attack on our faith. If belief and miracles go together, this makes our belief not so supernatural after all. It makes it subject to science instead of science acting as a helper to our belief. This is the incursion of evolution and naturalism in our faith. And that's why they're using the word miraculous for all sorts of things that aren't miraculous. It's one of the reasons why I'm giving you this talk tonight. This is a very important slide 
It's very hard for us to accept this, maybe, but it's true. There's an inversion going on. We'll know when there's a miracle. Now, just one last slide. The official approved Lord's miracles. You can see the most of them that have been approved by the local bishop for the approval of the apparition were seven to begin with. Remember, it happened in 1858. So there were seven miracles in the first year. These are all the ones that have been canonically approved. And you can see they're starting to get pretty thin. Apparently, there's one miracle here, but they're still not approved it yet. You can see there's a high point right before the 1950s. Right after World War II. Look at that big blank spot right there. World War I. There's only 66 fully approved Lord's miracles. That's how hard it is. There's tons of miracles there, but only those could go through that really stiff process. For those who believe, no explanation is needed. For those who do not believe, no explanation is possible. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.